Our presentation is entitled, Babylon is Alive and Well, that's the study guide, and then also, God has a church on earth, no kidding. Now, last evening, we spent some time looking at Babylon, and we're going to spend some more time in Revelation chapter 17, but the first passage of Scripture I'd like to take you to is actually in Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9, let's go there together. We'll probably begin in chapter 8 to sort of set the context for chapter 9, so you can find Ezekiel, that's the book just before Daniel. We're going to Ezekiel, and we'll start in chapter 8, Ezekiel chapter 8, and this is going to help us to understand the seriousness and the urgency of the commingling of truth and error. The seriousness and the urgency of the commingling of that which is true and biblical with that which is not true and is unbiblical. So I'm in Ezekiel chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. And here in Ezekiel chapter 8, we find the prophet Ezekiel receiving a, a tour de force of the abominations and error that had crept in even to Israel. And we're going to sort of take this tour with Ezekiel. It's really kind of fascinating how the tour takes place. God takes Ezekiel by a lock of his hair and uh, in prophetic vision lifts him up by his hair and actually starts taking him around on, as we've said, a tour de force of all of the abominations that were taking place. And the abominations get subsequently worse and worse and worse and worse. So let's pick that up in Ezekiel chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord fell upon me there. Then I looked, and there was a likeness, behold, like the likeness of fire, from the appearance of his waist downward, fire. From his waist upward, like the appearance of brightness, like the color of amber. Here he's seeing God in vision. Verse 3. He stretched out the form of a hand, and he took me by a lock of my hair, and the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven, and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the north gate of the inner court, where the seat of the image of jealousy was, which provokes to jealousy. Verse 4, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, like the vision that I saw in the plain. Then he said to me, Son of man, lift up your eyes now toward the north. So I lifted up my eyes toward the north, and there, north of the altar gate, was this image of jealousy in the entrance. That is to say, right in the very entrance of the temple of God, there was an idol that had been set up. Verse 6, Furthermore, he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go far away from my sanctuary? Now turn again, and you will see greater abominations." And so God here takes Ezekiel and he brings him right to the gate of the temple, the entrance of the temple, and sitting there was an altar, an image to a pagan god. And he says, do you see this? Do you see this image of jealousy right in the very entrance to my temple? And Ezekiel would have said, yes, I see that, Lord. And he says, I'll show you even greater abominations than these. Verse 7. So he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, there was a hole in the wall. And he said to me, Son of man, dig into the wall. And when I dug into the wall, there was a door. And he said to me, Go in and see the wicked abominations which they are doing there. Now remember, this is in the temple. Not the temple, uh, some pagan temple or the temple of Baal. This is the temple of God. Verse 10. So I went in and I saw there every sort of creeping thing, abominable beasts and all idols of the house of Israel portrayed all around on the walls. And there stood before them 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel. And in their midst stood Jehazaniah of the son of Shaphan. Each man had a censer in his hand and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the room of his idols, for they say, The Lord does not see us, the Lord has forsaken us. Verse 13, Then he said to me, Turn again, and you will see greater abominations than these that they are doing. And so he takes him from the image of jealousy, and now he brings me. He says, You see this hole in the temple wall? I see it. Dig into that hole, go in there, into the temple, and see what the priests are doing in darkness. And as Ezekiel, the prophet of the Lord, is sort of like a fly on the wall looking through the keyhole there, he sees that God's own priests, God's what, everyone? God's own priests were worshiping idols in an absolutely incredible way right in the very temple, right in the very house of God. And I can just imagine in my mind's eye Ezekiel saying, I can't believe this. I can't believe that the professed people of God are worshiping these idols in the temple of God. But he said to him, you think this is bad, you'll see even worse abominations than these. I'm in verse 14. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house, and to my dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. That's one of the fertility goddesses 
of paganism. Then he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again, and you will see greater abominations than these. Here were people weeping for this pagan goddess, Tammuz. And you can just imagine God saying, Do you see this, Ezekiel? These are my people. These aren't the heathen. These aren't the Gentiles. These aren't the pagans. These are my people. Do you see what they're doing? And I can just imagine Ezekiel saying, blah, blah, blah. I, I, I see it, Lord, but I can hardly believe it. And he says, You'll see greater abominations even than these. Verse 16, So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. And they were worshiping the what? They were worshiping the sun toward the east. And he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. Then they have returned to provoke me to anger. Indeed, they put the branch to their nose. That's uh, kind of an unusual uh, ancient way of saying that they're basically you know, snuffing at me. Uh, disinterested in me. Verse 18, Therefore I also will act in my fury. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. When, when God is taking Ezekiel on this sort of tour de force of the abominations of Israel, he caps it off with the capstone, the most egregious violation was the worship of the sun in the very temple of God. At each subsequent stage, he said, you see this? I see this. You'll see worse. Do you see this? I see this. You'll see worse. Do you see this? I see it. You'll see worse. And as the capstone, as the crescendo, he brings them right into the very house of God, and they're worshiping the sun in the temple of God. Fascinating. If you go on to read then in, in Ezekiel chapter 9, it's very interesting. What happens in Ezekiel chapter 9 is people receive a mark. People receive what, everyone? They receive a mark, and it's fascinating because that parallels exactly with the seal of God and the mark of the beast that we discover there in Revelation chapter 13. And those that didn't have God's mark, those that didn't have God's seal, were slain. Are we talking about serious things? Or are we talking about unimportant things? Which one? Serious things, beloved. And so in Ezekiel chapter 8 and Ezekiel chapter 9, we saw the worship of the sun right in the very temple of God. We're talking about Babylon. And we learned yesterday that Babylon is the center of man-made worship. They built the Tower of Babel. And they said, come let us build a tower up into the highest of the high heavens. And many expositors have recognized that they were going to probably build a temple. High, high, high. A tower. High, high, high. So that if the flood ever came again, they could save themselves by their own what? by their own works. And so Babylon represented man-made religion. But Babylon was also the center of image worship. And we talked about how all systems and, and streams of idolatry flowed from that fountainhead stream there in Babylon. So not only was it the center of image worship, not only was it the center of man-made religion, it was the center of false teachings about death. False, te false teachings about what, everyone? Death. And we talked about this idea of the immortality of the soul and how that crept into the church through the back door. It was basically a pagan concept that was adopted by the Pharisees, that was adopted by uh, the early church, uh, that is to say the Catholics, and has been bequeathed as a sacred legacy to Protestantism. But the idea of innate immortality or innate Inherent immortality is not a biblical teaching at all. In fact, it's a pagan teaching called platonic dualism, sometimes referred to as anthropological dualism. So now we're going to discover that Babylon is also the center of sun worship. The center of what, everyone? Sun worship, and that's right there in your study guide. The Worship of Nature, Volume 1, James Brazier. This is from page 529. The retention of the old pagan name of Dia Solis, that is Sunday, Right? Sunday. The retention of the old pagan name, Dia Solis, for Sunday is in a great measure owing to the union of pagan and Christian sentiment with which the what day of the week? The first day of the week was recommended by who? Constantine to his what? Subjects pagan and what? Christian alike as the venerable day of the sun. So this was a politically motivated thing. Constantine basically looked out at his empire. He saw that he had a significant percentage that were Christians, a significant percentage that were pagans, and out of political expediency, he decided to try and amalgamate. What word did I say, everyone? Amalgamate, which means to combine. He tried to combine this pseudo-paganism with this pseudo-Christianity and bring it all together, and the Christians were excited about it because they thought it was evangelism. The problem was is that those people that were coming into the church were not leaving their old ways at the door. They were bringing those old ways into the church. And so the people were not converted. They were simply making a profession. They were making a what, everyone? 
profession. In fact, that's what most historians believe about Constantine's own conversion. They believe that he didn't have anything like a conversion, most historians. They believe that Constantine's conversion was strictly a political, uh, politically expedient thing to do in order to sort of bring unity to his empire. And one of the things that they did is they united the Christian Sabbath, the, the Sabbath of the Lord, with the venerable day of the sun. And eventually, the, uh, for a time there, both days were kept. And then eventually the Sabbath day began to fall off and Sunday receives increasing and increasing prominence, and that's exactly what's being communicated here. Now notice this one from the Catholic World, March 1894, page 809, from William Gildea. The sun was a foremost god in heathendom. There's no surprise there. The sun has worshippers at this hour in Persia and other lands. There is, in truth, something royal, something kingly about the sun, making it a fit emblem of who? Jesus, the son of justice. The quotation goes on. Hence, the church in these countries would seem to have said, this is basically what the church said to the early uh, church there, this is what was being communicated to the followers, hey, keep that old pagan name, Sunday, it shall remain consecrated and sanctified, and thus the pagan Sunday, dedicated to Balder, one of the pagan sun gods, became the Christian Sunday, sacred to who, everyone? Jesus. So it was a transference of the venerable day of the sun, S-U-N, over to the Son of God, S-O-N. That's not something that Jesus did. That's not something the apostolic church did. That's something that took place in the third and fourth centuries as the church began to accommodate paganism. If that makes sense, I want you to say amen. And that's why we've consistently offered $10,000 cash for anybody who can produce any text that says that Jesus changed the Sabbath or that God changed the Sabbath or that the Apostolic Church changed the Sabbath. Are we together on that, everyone? There was a change in the Sabbath, but it wasn't done under Jesus' authority. It wasn't done under the Apostolic Church's authority. Of course not. Of course, they wouldn't have done anything contrary to what Jesus had done anyway. There was a change, but that change took place in the third and fourth centuries when basically pseudo-Christianity began to accommodate paganism and they amalgamated into something that was hardly indistinguishable from paganism itself. Just put a nice little Christian veneer over the top of it. So notice this one here from The Two Babylons by Dr. Alexander Hislop, page 105. To conciliate the pagans to nominal Christianity, that is to get them to be friends, Rome, pursuing its usual policy, took measures to get the Christian and pagan festivals amalgamated. In other words, they were going to bring together the Christian festivals, i.e. the Sabbath, and the pagan festivals, i.e. the venerable day of the sun and other pagan festivals, to bring them together. And to get paganism and what? Christianity now far sunk in idolatry in this as in so many other things to shake hands. Dr. Hislop says it was Rome's policy basically to uh, allow these uh, sort of uh, leagues to come together where, where this group would come and this group would come and they would just sort of amalgamate themselves into the existing culture rather than standing for Bible truth and for the truth of God. And that was Rome's policy and they've pursued it very effectively. Dr. E.T. Hiscox, the author of the Baptist Manual, we've quoted this before at length, we'll just quote it quickly here. What a pity that Sunday comes branded with the mark of paganism, he knew where it came from, and christened with the name of the sun god, then adopted and sanctified by the papal apostasy and bequeathed as a sacred legacy to who, everyone? Protestantism. And, and he's basically letting us know here, this is the origin of Sunday. It's called the Sun Day for good reason. In the same way that Monday is the Moon Day and Thursday is Thor's Day and Saturday is Saturn's Day, Sunday was the day on which the venerable day of the sun was carried out, the worship of the sun god. And notice this here in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 26. Her priests have violated my what? My law and have profaned my what? Holy things. Now notice this. This is absolutely fascinating. This was God's complaint against the priests in the days of Ezekiel. He said, they have not distinguished between the what? The holy and the unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the clean and the unclean, and they have hidden their eyes from my what? 
Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. There was already a concern in the days of Ezekiel that, that the priests had basically abandoned the distinction between what God has made as holy and what is not holy, between what God has declared as clean and what is unclean, and that is exactly what's happening today. You'll meet many good pastors, and don't get me wrong, I've met you know Methodist pastors and Presbyterian pastors and Baptist pastors, all who love the Lord Jesus very much, and I don't question their, their sincerity or their commitment to Him, but when you ask these men, why go to church on Sunday when the Bible says the Sabbath? In time after time after time, meeting after meeting after meeting, I hear things like, well, that's the day everybody goes. Of course, it would be impossible to change it. It would be inconvenient to change it. And you just hear a list of excuses and a list of justifications and rationalizations a mile long. And incidentally, if you go talk to your pastors, you're going to get the same list of justifications, the same list of rationalizations a mile long. But at the end of the day, it's all about convenience. It's all about what, everyone? Convenience. And that's what it is about. It's not about the Bible. It's not about what the Lord says. It's not about what the Word says. It's about what's convenient and accommodating the culture. Accommodating what, everyone? The culture. But if I read my Bible right, Jesus did not accommodate culture when it came to a plain thus saith the Lord. Jesus, in fact, became in many instances anti-culture. Not that Jesus was out to be obnoxious or obstinate, but Jesus always stood on what he knew was God's will. And God's complaint here in Ezekiel is that the priests, that is the religious spiritual leaders, were not making a distinction. Not making a what, everyone? A distinction between that which is sacred and that which is not. Between that which is clean and that which is not. If somebody says to you, all days are the same, it doesn't matter, it's not a big deal, you know that they are not making a distinction between what God has said is holy and what is unholy. Does that make sense, everyone? Someone says, well, you know, every day is holy. You should worship the Lord every day. No one is arguing with that. You want to go to church on Monday? Praise the Lord. You want to go to church on Tuesday? Praise the Lord. Wednesday? Praise the Lord. Thursday? No problem with any of that. But let's be crystal clear about something. It was God, not a church. It was God, not Pastor Asherick. It was God, not a man, that originally set the Sabbath aside. Can you say amen to that? I mean, God, David didn't invent that. David didn't say, you know, uh, you know let's, let's have fun. Let, let's say that one day is more important than another. God was the one who said that, not me. And apparently it was important enough to God and morally significant enough to God to write it with his own finger on tables of stone and take those tablets and place them in the ark, which is the very sign and symbol of the throne of God. So here's my rationale. If it's important to God, by definition, it should be important to God's followers. Amen. Does that make sense? And so we can say, well, you know, I don't know. To me, it just doesn't seem important. Beloved, who cares if it seems important to you? Since when do Christians do things that seem important and decide that we're not going to do things that don't seem important? I was just visiting with my friend Angelo the other day, and Angelo, like me, loves to go knocking on doors and telling people about the love of Jesus. Amen? And some people are going to say, well, you know, that's not really for me. That doesn't seem like something that's important. That doesn't seem like something I'd want to do. Beloved, it's not what you think seems right. It's not what you think think seems okay or seems justified. It's what God says. Amen. I mean, beloved, in the final analysis for me and my purposes, and I hope for you and your purposes, if it's in the Bible, I believe it. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. So far, so good, everyone? Pretty simple. And so God was concerned about religious leaders that said, well, it's really not important. Well, it's really not a big deal. They made no distinction, they made no difference between the sacred and the profane. Jesus put it this way in Mark chapter 7 and verse 7, and by the way, no preacher would have been a more grace-filled preacher, a more spirit-filled preacher than Jesus, and yet Jesus said, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the what? commandments of men. And that's exactly what's happening today. Doctrines are being taught, but they are the commandments of men rather than the commandments of God. And so let's go to end time Babylon here and let's see if we can identify exactly who this is. It's right there on your study guide and we're going to go to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. And so we've looked at these four critical areas that Babylon basically exemplifies. Number one, it is a man-made system of religion. This is all in your study guide. Number two, it is the center of image worship. Number three, it is the center of false teachings about death. And number four, Babylon was the center of sun worship. 
All of those things are incorporated into this biblical term of Babylon. And so when we go to Revelation chapter 17, and we find here in verse 5 that she is called mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth, we have to go back and biblically see what that means. What does it mean biblically Babylon? It's a system that is confusing. It's a system of man-made religion. It's a system of image worship. It's a system of sun worship. It's a system of false teachings about death. And this woman here, this false church, is branded with this, this emblazoned placard across her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Now let's see if we can identify exactly who this is. First of all, number one, she's a church. How do we know that? Because in chapter 1 it says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying, Come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. The great what, everyone? Harlot, that is the great woman. And as we've already discussed, a woman in Bible prophecy represents what? A church or God's true people. And so if you have a chaste woman, like in Revelation chapter 12, that would be God's true people. And if you have an unfaithful woman, like in Revelation chapter 17, that would be an unfaithful church. Does that make sense, everyone? Yes or no? Very, very clear. And so she's a church. She sits on an area of many nations. Look at chapter uh, 17, verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her what? Fornication. Notice that she sits on many waters, last part of verse 1. And so you jump down to verse 15 of the same chapter. Verse 15 of the same chapter, Then he, the angel, said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And so she's depicted as sitting on water. We've already seen that water in Bible prophecy represents a populous area. And so she sits on an area of many nations. Number three, she is a city. Jump down to the last verse of that chapter, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 18. And the woman whom you saw is that great what? city which rules over the kings of the earth. And so whoever this is, it's a city as well. So it's a church that sits on an area of many nations. That's a city we've already seen that rules over kings. That is to say, is in illicit uh, fornication-like relationships with the kings of the earth, the secular governing authorities. Also, this is a city of seven hills. A city of what, everyone? Seven hills. Look at verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven what? mountains on which the woman sits. And so it's a city that sits on seven hills or seven mountains. Number six, her official colors are purple and what? Scarlet. We saw that there in verse three, a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Verse four, uh, in, uh, she was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones. And as we've already discussed, there were four colors that the high priests wore in the Old Testament. Do you remember those four colors? Purple, scarlet, blue, and gold. Let's say that together. Purple, scarlet, blue, and gold, okay? But this woman is missing one of those colors. Which color is she missing? Blue. blue. W what did blue represent? Ten Commandments. In fact, let me show you something quite fascinating. It's right there in your study guide. Go to Numbers chapter 15, but keep your finger here in Revelation 17. Go to Numbers 15, but keep your finger here. Numbers chapter 15, fourth book of the Old Testament. Numbers chapter 15. And I think you'll find this language very interesting. Numbers chapter 15, beginning in verse 37. Numbers chapter 15, beginning in verse 37. I want everybody to get there. Tell me if you, if you find this language striking, yes or no. Numbers chapter 15 and verse 37. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel, tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a what kind of thread? A blue thread in the tassels of their corners. And you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the what? commandments of your Lord and do them. Now watch this. That you may not follow the what? The harlotry to which your own heart and your eyes are inclined and that you may remember and do all the commandments of the Lord your God for I am holy. I am the Lord. Isn't that absolutely fascinating? Notice what it says. Put blue on your garments to remember what everyone? The commandments so that you won't go after what? harlotry. And what do we find in Revelation chapter 17? We find a harlot woman who's wearing all of the colors of the high priest. She's got the purple. She's got the scarlet. She's got the gold. But what color is she missing? Blue. The blue. So she's pretending to be, if you prefer, she's pretending to be God's high priest, God's church on earth, but she has forgotten God's commandments. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. 
absolutely fascinating. And so we go here. She's wearing purple and scarlet. She's obviously wealthy. That's inferred from the text. You can also read in chapter 18, verse 3. Let's go back to Revelation, as a matter of fact. Should have kept a pen or a ribbon or a finger or something there, so we can just flip back quickly. It says in chapter 18, verse 3, that she is a rich church. We jump down now to number 8. She is a persecuting church. It says right there in the passage, we're looking at verse 6. I saw the woman who was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And also she is blasphemous as she has emblazoned right across her forehead. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. So she clearly is a blasphemous, blasphemous power. And so when we put all of these together, when we put together a church that sits on an area of many nations, that is a city that rules over kings, that has seven mountains or seven hills. By the way, what city is the city of seven mountains? This is the city of Rome. That's exactly right. I looked it up just today, incidentally, on Wikipedia. Just type that in. City of seven mountains, boom, takes you right to Rome. It names all the seven mountains, and then it takes you right to this very verse in Revelation chapter 17, and it says that this is a widely held reference in Protestantism to Rome. Right there. I mean, listen, beloved, you can go right to Wikipedia. Now, that does not mean that you can trust everything you find on the Internet. Someone say amen. I mean, the internet is a sewer. There's good and there's bad on there. And the problem is, is that any wacko can get a website and he can start saying thus and so, thus and so, thus and so. So don't trust everything you read on the internet. Amen? But you can trust everything you read in the Bible. Amen? By the way, some people say, oh, you know, I looked up David Ashrick on the internet and I found out he was, you know, a Seventh-day Adventist and that he was a member of a cult. Beloved, just ask me what church you go I go to. I'll tell you what church I go to. I have no shame in that. I believe that God's Seventh-day Sabbath is an important day. How many of you believe that God's Seventh-day Sabbath is an important day? Okay, there you go. So you're Seventh-day too. Now, I believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon. How many of you believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon? Okay, then that means you're an Adventist. Okay, because you believe in the advent of the Lord. Does that make sense? And so you're a Seventh-day Adventist. That's what I mean when I say I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, Bible-believing, Spirit-filled Christian. Everything that comes from the Bible, I want to follow it. Can you say amen? Yeah. There's nothing mysterious. There's nothing spooky. There's nothing unusual about that title. It means that I believe that God's Seventh-day Sabbath is important because it's the commandment that begins with the word remember, and the whole world has decided to forget... Number one, and number two, I believe that Jesus is soon to come and put an end to this old, dismal, dark, disease-ridden world. Can you say amen to that? So that's what I'm saying when I say I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Oh, I looked him up on the internet. He's a Seventh-day Adventist. Let me tell you something. No shame in that. But here's something absolutely critical. If websites had existed in the days of Jesus, do you know what they would have said about Jesus? Yeah, listen, they called him the devil to his face. They called him a Samaritan to his face. They called him a glutton and a wine-bibber to his face. So you can imagine what the anonymity of the Internet would do. I mean, that's the thing about the Internet is nobody can see you. There's no accountability. Joe Schmo starts up a web page and says anything he wants to say. People get on there. They think because it's on a computer, it's credible. Beloved, the Internet may or may not be credible, but the Bible is always credible. Amen and amen to that. And so who could this possibly be? Who could this church possibly be? Clothed in purple and scarlet, decked with gold and precious stones. There's only one answer. And by the way, this is not something that Pastor Asherick just invented. Number one, it's biblical. And number two, this is the historic interpretation of Protestantism. It is the, what did I say, everyone? The historic interpretation of Protestantism. You say, Protestantism, why do you keep using that term? Its root word is protest. Protestants protested. Well, what were they protesting? The abuses of the mother church. And so today I stand before you absolutely proud to be a Protestant because when I protest the abuses of the church, what I'm standing for is truth. If that makes sense, say amen. Okay, that's not to align myself with any, you know, religious entity or say, I'm in and you're out and you're not part of my club. No, no, no. We're a, we are protesting the abuses of the church. Does that make sense, everyone? Amen. So look at this. This is just from a regular old run-of-the-mill. It's actually quite an excellent Bible commentary, Protestant Bible commentary. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, page 593, commenting on this very chapter. State and church are precious gifts of God. Can you say amen? amen. But the state being desecrated becomes beast-like. The church apostatizing becomes the what? Harlot. Harlot. Absolutely incredible. Notice this. The first justification of the woman is in her being called out of Babylon, the harlot, when judgment is about to fall. Now notice this, his language, not mine. For apostate Christendom, Babylon is not to be converted, but to be what? Destroyed. Destroyed. Now you're still there in Revelation chapter 17. Look at Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. 
After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is what? Fallen is fallen. Whenever the Bible says something like that twice, it's for emphasis. It's not that John is stuttering. What he's saying is, it's fallen, it's fallen. It means it's absolutely, positively sure. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a cage for every foul spirit, a, uh, uh, pardon me, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth, that's, uh, that's uh, the joining of church state, by the way. You can see it plain as the noonday sun there. The merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Verse 4, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of what? Her. her. Who's her? Babylon. Come out of Babylon. And notice the next two words. My people, lest you share in her what? Commentary, look at it again. It says, for apostate Christendom, Babylon is not to be converted, but what? Destroyed, and notice it says the first justification of the woman is in her being called out of what? Babylon. They're called out of Babylon. Okay? That is to say, you come out because it's going to be destroyed. In the very same way that Lot was brought out of the city so that Sodom could be destroyed, so that Gomorrah could be destroyed, God says to his people, I don't want you to share in her plagues. I don't want you to share in her sins. Come out of Babylon so that you do not participate in her destruction. If that makes sense, say amen. So let's go to our study guide here. Study guide here, and uh, we can go all the way to the last page. Or not the last page, pardon me, the third page. Come out of her, my people. Third page. Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 to 5, finds, finds God's people calling, uh, finds God calling his people, pardon me, out of end time Babylon. God claims the people, but the systems that teach error and ignore the plain teachings of the Bible are judged and disavowed. The importance of this point simply cannot be overstated. Like Lot of old, God calls his people out prior to the coming destruction. Babylon is not to be converted, but what? Destroyed. destroyed. Babylon is not to be converted. Babylon is to be destroyed. God has his precious people in Babylon, and he calls them out. It is not difficult to discern whether or not one is in Babylon. One need only ask and answer a simple question. Here it is. You want to go, I wonder if he's talking about me. I wonder if this chapter is talking about me. I wonder if God's talking about me when he says come out of Babylon. All you have to do is ask and answer one question, and here it is. Does my church, my community of faith, contain any residual papal, pardon me, papal, pagan, or Babylonian elements or teachings? Okay, that's all you have to do is answer that one question. Does my church contain any residual paganism, any residual papalism, and any residual Babylonianism? If the answer to that question is yes, then you are in Babylon. Look at it there in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 5. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 5. And on her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of what? Harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And so this, this mother church has daughters. This mother church has what, everyone? Daughters. And those daughters are any churches that cling to residual papalism or residual paganism. That is what the Bible is calling Babylon. Now, you might be thinking, whoa, Pastor Asherick is speaking so strongly here. No, Pastor Asherick's not speaking strongly. The Bible is speaking strongly. If we have, and I know we have, correctly here identified Babylon, then Babylon's daughters would be those uh, churches that are not identical to Babylon, but are similar. Are what, everyone? Similar. I'll give you a case in point, and I hope you don't feel like I'm picking on you, but I feel like I can speak with at least a little bit of authority on this because I was raised in the Episcopalian Church. Okay. My father was a Catholic who, uh, you know, in his own way, um, wanted to be a religious person. He wanted to be a spiritual person, and he was married, and he went all the way through Catholic schools and all the way through uh, um, uh, into Catholicism, into the church. He was married in the church, but then he got divorced, and the church would not recognize his divorce. And so when he remarried my mother, uh, when he was remarried, he married my mother. My mother was kind of a Baptist, sort of a Protestant or something. The problem was is that the church would not recognize his divorce. They said, we don't recognize your divorce. As far as we're concerned, you're still married to your first wife. And my dad's like, listen, <laughs> You, you, you got another thing coming. I'm not only not married to her, she's remarried and I'm getting ready to get remarried. Church says, we don't recognize it. So what happened is my father was no longer a Catholic because he couldn't be. Okay? So he remarries, he marries my mother and my mother was kind of a nominal Protestant and they said, well, what are we going to do? I mean, we can't be Catholics because they kicked you out the door. We can't really be Protestants because you don't know anything about Protestantism. So they became Episcopalians. 
And I don't know if you know anything about Episcopalianism, but Episcopalians are basically as close as you can get to Rome without the Pope. That's basically what an Episcopalian is. It's, it's Catholicism without the Pope. Now, if you go to an Episcopalian church and you go to a Catholic church, the similarities are phenomenal. I mean, just absolutely, totally phenomenal. Why? Because what happened is, is that the Episcopalian church, basically a man by the name of Henry, uh, King Henry, Henry VIII, wanted to have another wife, and the Bishop of Rome said no, and he said, well, I'll start my own church, and he started the Anglican church. That's the short version, right? And so basically what happened is, he came a little bit out of Rome, but not very far out of Rome. Does that make sense? And so he's pretty close. And then another denomination came out a little further, and then a little further, and a little further. And all of these various denominations that we have today are just in different degrees of coming out of Rome. Does that make sense, everyone? And so the question is whether or not you're in Babylon is actually very, very simple. If you have any residual paganism or papalism or Babylonianism that is part and parcel of the teaching of your church as, as opposed to the teaching of God's holy word, then God would say, come out of Babylon and let Babylon come out of you. Can you say amen? Now that can be a little hard for us to hear, but beloved, that's what God says. That's not what Pastor Asherick says. That's what God says. And so let's continue on here in our study guide. Babylon is not to be converted but destroyed. It is not difficult to discern whether or not one is in Babylon. One, one need only ask and answer the simple question, does my church, my community of faith, contain any residual papal, papal pagan, or Babylonian elements and teachings? And uh, out of Babylon into what? Let's go back to the screen here. In every apostate or world-conforming church, there are some of God's invisible and true church. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Who, if they would be safe, must what? come out. That's exactly what Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown said. Again, that's, an, that's a very well-known, very, very, very well-known Protestant commentary. Now, this raises the important question. Is it clear to you that God is calling His people out of Babylon, yes or no? By the way, don't even, don't even think of being offended. Don't even try to be offended, because God is the one that says, come out of her, my people. You do not have to be offended if you're one of God's true people who in ignorance has been in a system of Babylonianism. Okay, because now you've learned it. Now you've what, everyone? You've learned it. And God calls you His people. No shame in that, amen? I mean, beloved, when I, when I decided I was going to follow the Word, when I decided that the Lord Jesus Christ was going to be my Savior and I was going to stand on the Bible and the Bible only, I had to take a step out of my parents' church because I saw that it wasn't biblical. Now, again, that's not to make fun of anybody today who happens to be an Episcopalian or et cetera, et cetera. You want to be an Episcopalian, that's your business. But what I am saying is this. If you want to stand on the Bible, you're going to have to take a step out of any church that doesn't stand on the Bible. Does that make sense? Yes or no? I mean, how could you sit in church and listen to people preaching things that you know are not biblical? Biblical. How can you give your money and your offering and your influence and your energies to a church that is teaching things that you know is not biblical? And so it was not like, oh, I'm going to leave the church because I'm mad at the church and I don't like the Episcopalians anymore. They were dear people. I love those people, no question. But when I saw the church come into conflict with God's law, I decided to stand on the Bible instead of uh, the church's uh, canons and traditions. Does that make sense, everyone? And so don't get offended. Don't think, oh, you know, he's, I can't believe those things he said about Episcopalians or about Methodists or about whatever. Beloved, it's not about being offended. It's about being faithful to God. Amen. Does that make sense, everyone? Amen. Okay, great. Praise the Lord Jesus. We're making some great headway. So God says, come out of Babylon. And so we all step out by faith. But the question is, we step out of Babylon into what? See, God not only calls people out, He calls people in. Does that make sense? I mean, He calls us out of something into what? Into obscurity, into chaos, into nothingness? No, 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 no. He calls us out of Babylon into his remnant church. In fact, look right there in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And notice with me verse 17. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. It says, speaking of the remnant church, Revelation chapter 12 verse 17, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the what? Now, your Bible says remnant. Mine says the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So God here has a remnant. 
I want everyone a remnant. Now this is straight out of Old Testament. This is classic Old Testament theology that, that uh, you'd find texts like this. All of Israel would go into captivity, but a remnant would be preserved. All of Israel would go into apostasy, but a remnant would be preserved. So this idea of remnant theology is not something that was just invented by John in the Apocalypse. It's something that is all the way through. Noah was a remnant. Think of it that way. The whole earth had gone into absolute apostasy and violence against God, but God saved a remnant. You find that again and again. Daniel had gone into Babylonian captivity for 70 years, but God called a remnant out of that. Okay? God is in the habit of calling remnants of people because, unfortunately, the, uh, Satan, uh, the arch enemy, he deceives people into going the wrong way, and then God is able to get his hands wrapped around a few, and he calls them out. He calls them what? Out. Now, some people are going to say, well, listen, I'm not getting called on anything. I, I'm going to stay with my church, and I'm going to do my own thing. Beloved, beloved, you, you do whatever you want. But the point is this. Don't think that when it comes to salvation, there's safety in numbers. Amen. 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 Don't, think, don't, even, don't even think that for a moment. Don't think, well, listen, I'm going to a church, and there's 10,000 members in my church, and there's good people in my church, and, and so surely, because there's other people in this church that are going to be saved, I can stay here and be safe. Listen, God didn't bring all those other people to this series of meetings. God brought you to this series of meetings. Does that make sense? So God, God reveals at certain times truth to certain people because He can trust you with it. Fortunately, you don't have to answer for anybody else in your church. Can you say amen? You only got to answer for one, and that's you. Okay? And the fact that other people might have gotten invitations or the Spirit of God might be working on other people's hearts and they may be responding at different times or some of them obstinately might not be responding, that has nothing to do with you. Don't think for a moment, well, there's all kinds of faithful people in my church and, and uh, surely some of them are going to be saved and so I'll stay here and I'll be just fine. God is saving people individually. Does that make sense, everyone? And God wants to save you individually. There's no question. And so God reveals things to you at a time when He thinks you can handle it. God wants to trust you with His truth. Can you say amen? amen. Absolutely. Very simple here. And so what we, what we see here is that God does have a true church. She's called the remnant. Now notice in Revelation 12, 17, it says the remnant have at least two characteristics. They have the testimony of Jesus and they keep the commandments of God. Now, I told you uh, several, I suppose it's been almost uh, halfway back uh, through the seminar, that my grandmother used to take me to the most boring place on earth. Who remembers where was that? Yeah. Fabric store. That's exactly right. And uh, not only would she buy those, you know, absolutely boring, innocuous little white envelopes, sometimes she would go to the remnant box. She'd go to the what? Remnant box, where there would be remnants of cloth. Is that right? And so, it, it, let's say she wanted to match, for example, this suit here. If she was going to find a remnant to match this suit here, she'd go to the various bolts of cloth and they'd say, you know, we don't have that, but you can check the remnant pile. And so she'd go through and she'd start looking through the remnants, and if she found one that truly matched this, it would have to be the same uh, texture, it would have to be the same color, it would have to be the same pattern, it would have to be the same weight in order to truly be the remnant of this fabric. Does that make sense, everyone? Yes or no? So the remnant, God's last day church, has to look like God's first day church. Does that make sense? It can't look radically different. It has to match. If it's the remnant, it has to match. And so we can't look for something new. We can't look for something totally radical and different. We have to look for something that's basically the same as the apostolic church. Amen? God is going to bring His people back to apostolic Christianity. It reminds me of a marvelous statement I heard Billy Graham say one time. And I tell you, my heart really goes out to Billy Graham because I think uh, in some ways he's abandoning the faith. I don't know if you saw this most recent, uh, and I'm not judging the man at all, but if you've seen this, uh, uh, this Newsweek that he was on the cover of a little while back, you know, they interview him and he's like, well, I'm not so sure that everything in the Bible is true. And, and uh, I mean, I was just reading, I'm thinking, who am I reading? Who, am, who could I possibly be reading? But anyway, let the Lord Jesus sort that out. I'll tell you this. He, there's no question that God did use that man to reach many people, thousands of people, millions of people for the Lord. Can you say amen? amen. And on one occasion, he was preaching a marvelous revival in New York City. And uh, he preached his guts out, you know, and just threw down. And he was a very kind of, he could be a wild preacher in his earlier years. And he just preached and preached and preached. And he made an altar call. And, you know, people came forward and they were repenting and, you know, weeping at the altar. And it was absolutely powerful. And afterward, several of the organizers of the event, they went up to Mr. Graham. They said, Mr. Graham, we're very concerned about tonight's presentation. Oh, what? You, uh, you didn't think it was a good presentation? No, they said, you know, we're concerned. We feel like you've set the church back 200 years today. I mean, you're going back to the dark ages. You're going back to the way that things 
things used to be done. We're, we want to be part of the new church, part of the emerging church, part of this new exciting movement that God is doing in Christianity. We feel like you set the church back 200 years. And, you know, Pastor Graham kind of hung his head and he said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm you know, real sorry about that. I guess I really did fail. And they were kind of, you know, triumphing over him a little bit. Yeah, we really feel like he let us down. And he said, you know, gentlemen, I apologize. Tonight, if, if, if you feel like I set the church back 200 years, I did fail. I absolutely failed because I was trying to set the church back 2,000 years. Amen. You with me, everyone? Amen. You follow where we're going with that? Amen. Beloved, the remnant is going to look like apostolic Christianity. It's got a match. It's got a match. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay, so let's go to our board here. It's actually pretty simple. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, the Apostle Paul writing to young Timothy, he says, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Now notice this, the pillar and ground of what? The truth. Beloved, the church is to be built upon truth, and Jesus Christ is the truth. Can you say amen? amen. Think about that for just a moment. Jesus Christ is the truth. He himself said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the Life. John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is what? Truth. Psalm 119 says, Thy law is what? Truth. So you have this threefold definition of truth. Jesus Christ is truth. His word is truth. His law is truth. And the church is the pillar and ground of truth. That's why I've said many times in this seminar, and I'll stand by it until the day that I die, we don't find a church that suits us and then hope, cross our fingers, and, and pray that they preach the truth. What we do is we find the truth and then we go find a church that preaches what's truth. Can you say amen? amen? So too with your pastors. And I know many of you have spiritual leaders that you respect, etc., etc. But beloved, 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 don't check the truth out with your pastor. Check your pastor out with Bible truth. Can you say amen? amen. Because listen, I want to tell you something. If, if I were to take my shirt off here, which I won't do because I don't want to be indelicate, but if I were to take my shirt off right now, there is no Superman tattoo on my chest. There's no super pastor, super saint outfit under here. I'm a sinner just like you. Can you say amen? And I can be wrong just like you can be wrong. Can you say amen? But the Word of God cannot be wrong. So don't think for a moment that your pastor can't be wrong. I'm telling you pastors can be wrong, and if you don't believe me, you can talk to my wife, and she'll tell you he can be wrong. But the Word can't be wrong. Can you say amen? And, and the concern I have here is that we're saying, well, you know, I just like this church, and I love the stained glass, and I love being a part of the choir, and, and they have such a nice social hour, and I love the programs for the kids, and we have a wonderful women's book club, and on and on and on and on. But at the end of the day, if that church is not the pillar and ground of truth, you're in the wrong church. Amen. Does that make sense? Even if you're happy as a leprechaun, if you're, if you're in a truth that is not preaching, if you're in a church that's not preaching the truth, you're in the wrong church. Does that, does that make sense, everyone? I mean, is that radical? Is that too radical, yes or no? I, I hope it doesn't sound too radical to me. Let's continue on here. We have this woman that we're being called out of, Babylon, the mother of harlots. And uh, it is a man-made system of religion, as we've already said. It's the center of image worship, as we've said. It's the center of false teachings about death, as we've said. It's the center of sun worship. If you have any of those residual elements, uh, in addition to many other residual elements that could be cited, you should seriously consider evaluating your commitment to a church that's not standing on truth. Does that make sense, everyone? Y yes or no? Absolutely. By the way, don't be afraid of that. Jesus himself changed churches, if you want to use that language. Okay? Because when Jesus began his public ministry, he went in and he said to those people who were, uh, you know, selling things in the temple, he said, take these things out of here. You've made my father's house a what? A den of thieves. But at the end of his public ministry, three and a half years later, after they had consistently rejected the evidences of his messiahship and his divinity, he said, your house is left to you what? Desolate. So Jesus, Je was Jesus a Jew? Sure, Jesus not only was a Jew, I mean, Jesus was the one who had himself called Abraham the first Jew. I mean, Jesus, great, 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 great grandfather built that temple. I mean, Solomon and, and David, and you, of course the Solomonic temple had been destroyed. But the point here is, is that if anybody had their roots in a religious system, it was Jesus. But when Jesus saw that that religious system refused to follow truth, he left the system and followed truth. And he established something called the church. We're going to talk about that tomorrow morning. Who is real is real. Beloved, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'd rather worship with 12 people under an oak tree 
on truth and in spirit than with 5,000 people in the most glorious cathedral with the most charismatic pastor. Can you say amen? amen? I hope you feel the same way. I really, really, really hope you do. And so uh, Babylon the Great. Constantine sought to unite his empire by professing Christianity. We've already said that. And as we've discussed yesterday, many of these uh, churches are rushing back to get back into bed with the great mother church, Rome. In fact, they're wanting to distance themselves from anything that separate themselves from Rome. And as we discussed yesterday, who's making all of the concessions? The Protestants or the Catholics? Now, the Protestants are the ones making the concessions. During the Dark Ages, God's church fled into the wilderness. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. During the time of, of Constantine and just after the time of Constantine, basically if you didn't get on with the program, you could be persecuted. And if you wouldn't bow to the popes and the prelates and all of the various dogmas and decrees of papalism, you were persecuted. And so God's true church, God's true people, fled into the what, everyone? Into the wilderness. And so I'm in Revelation chapter 12. And I'll pick it up in verse, let's see, uh, verse 4. Six, so the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. We've already seen that that's the 1,260 years of papal oppression and the woman fled into the wilderness because basically there was only one show in town and that show was the Roman church. She had to leave because of persecution. Because of what, everyone? It's, it's not like our day and age where we pull out this, you know, monolithically large phone book and we say, well, what church should we go to? And there's page after page after page after page after page after page of any kind of church to fit any kind of lifestyle, whatever you want. In those days, there was one gig in town. <laughs> there was the church, not the churches, the church. And when the church basically said it's our way or the highway, it's our way or the stake, it's our way or it's the Colosseum, many people said, hey, listen, we're out of here. We want to worship God according to the dictates of our own conscience. And they fled into the wilderness where they could worship God in spirit and in truth, even at significant inconvenience to themselves. And so the church fled into the wilderness. And you have there marvelous, marvelous in the, the valleys of northern Italy and other places, the great Piedmont Valleys. You have people like the Waldensians and the Huguenots and the Albigenses and others who fled papal persecution so that they could worship God in spirit and in truth in the wilderness rather than capitulate to the papal dogmas, decrees, and doctrines. Is everybody with me, everyone? Yes or no? And so that's exactly what Bible prophecy said, that they would flee into the wilderness. Now, it's amazing to see here that in Revelation chapter 12, it says that the serpent cast out of his mouth water like a flood, that he might cause the woman to be carried away by the flood. Very interesting, it says, though. Look at verse 15, Revelation chapter 12, verse 15. It says, so the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth, what did it do for the woman? helped the woman and it opened its mouth and it swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And we've already been over this in Revelation chapter 13. God opened up a whole new continent. God opened up a whole new hemisphere and people fleeing civil persecution and religious persecution landed on these glorious shores, got off, kissed the ground and said, here we'll establish a new kind of government, not with subjects, but with citizens, a government of the people, for the people, and what? By the people. God basically opened up a whole new land where his church could flee from papal persecution and flee from monarchical persecution and establish a true government that would keep the church and the state as separate rather than bed partners and thus ensure that religious persecution could not transpire. If this makes sense, say amen. Believe that with every bit of my being. And, and I would challenge you to go look at some of American history and the providences of God. I mean, providence after providence after providence after providence. They don't teach it in schools anymore because you can't mention the name of God. The point is this. It would have been impossible for this nation to have come about the way that it did, in the manner that it did, as quickly as it did, without the special intervention and providence of God. Incredible what God has done for this nation. That's why it says that he, he had two horns like a lamb. Like a what? A lamb. And he espoused the great principles of republicanism. That is uh, civil liberty and, and uh, Protestantism. That is religious liberty. But unfortunately, it said that it would eventually speak like a what? Like a dragon. And we know that that's where it's going. I mean, beloved, in the post-9-11 world, with the passage of the Patriot Act and a hundred other things, I don't know if you're feeling it, but your civil liberties are just getting like this, and like this, and like this, and like this, and like this. And what's happening is, is that personal liberties are being sacrificed increasingly on the altar of national security. That's, that's the direction you're headed, beloved. And if I read my Bible right, and I think I do, it's only going to get tighter and tighter and uglier and uglier and uglier until eventually it climaxes with the mark of the beast crisis. 
That's the direction that we're headed. Absolutely incredible. You're getting the big picture here. Now, I want to fast forward here through two slides because I want you to see something that is absolutely critical. There it is. Now, this is a simplified slide, but it will help you to sort of see what happened from the 1400s to the 1800s. God started calling faithful men. And so you basically had the period of the Dark Ages, and then these people that I've just described in the valleys of northern Italy, they said, no, we will not stand for the papal dogmas, the papal decrees, and the papal teachings. We will stand on the Bible. And they went away to these incredible, you can go take tours even now, Reformation tours up in the valleys of northern Italy, and go to the very museums, the very places where these people, sometimes they'd be caught and slaughtered. I mean, it's just terrible, terrible. But they would, in the quietness of their homes up in the high mountain valleys, they would start transcribing the Bible. People like the Walden. And they said, it's the Bible, it's the Bible, it's the Bible. And then after that, a man by the name of John Huss came on the scene, one of the great reformers, and he said, no, it's obedience. Not obedience to man, but obedience to God. And then a man by the name of Martin Luther. Martin what, everyone? Luther is reading through his Bible one day, and he came across the four words that rocked the world. The just shall live by faith. Just live by faith. And he found those words, and he said, whoa, whoa, and he saw that that was radically incompatible with the Roman system. And so he nailed those 95 theses to the door there at Wittenberg, and so he came out a little bit further. But he didn't come all the way out. A man named John Calvin came out a little further, and he emphasized Christian growth and God's sovereignty. And then the Anabaptists came out and said, baptism by immersion, not this sprinkling stuff. And then John Wesley said, emphasis on holiness. They were called Methodists. That was actually a derogatory term, but they took that term and they incorporated that term. They embraced that term. Then a man by the name of William Miller began to a radical, radical movement here in the United States of America called Millerism, where he said, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. And many people believe that. Some estimate that he had as many as 100 or 200,000 followers, and there was this sudden apocalyptic sense that Jesus was coming soon. And then this thing called the Advent Movement. I'm going to talk to you about that tomorrow. Uh, putting the emphasis back on the Sabbath, the truth about death, and the importance of Christian lifestyle and living for the glory of God. And so basically what you see is uh, people were coming out of Rome, but instead of continuing to walk out of Rome, they would plant their banner and they'd say, we're Lutherans. Even though Martin Luther said, don't call yourself Lutherans, they set up their banner, we're Lutherans. Somebody came out a little further, planted their banner, we're Calvinists. But truth was marching on. Truth was what? Marching on. But everybody just sort of, and they stopped and they felt safe there. And so they started writing their decrees and they started writing their creeds and they started writing their codes and truth was marching on. And so somebody came out a little further, but instead of keep going, they plant their banner and say, we're Calvinists. Somebody comes out a little further, plants their banner, we're Baptists. Somebody comes out a little further, plants their banner, we're Methodists. Somebody comes out a little further, we're this. A little further, we're this. A little further, we're this. That's why there's so many different denominations. The reason there are so many different denominations is that every denomination is at various stages of coming out of apostate Rome. And unfortunately, people have set up their banners and they've set up their camps at different areas along that continuum. But at the end of time, God is going to have a remnant that will abandon all paganism, will abandon all uh, papalism, and will stand for the Bible and the Bible only. So God not only calls us out of Babylon, God calls us into this remnant movement, and it's bigger than a church. It's a movement. It's a what? It's a movement. And this chart sort of depicts that powerfully and, and compellingly, and we'll talk more about that tomorrow night.